Hey, hey, Mark Thrym and Marcus House with you here, and welcome to our collaborative series of the SpaceX Mars colonization mission, shown here with the newly presented Interplanetary Transport System rocket. Now, before I say anything here, Mark Thrym has spent a massive amount of time meticulously creating this SpaceX ITS mod, which is now a very close approximation to the presented SpaceX design. He has literally been pouring his spare time into these custom modded parts over the last few weeks and already has the mod up for all you guys to play with. The link for this mod is in the description of course and it supports both Kerbal Space Program 1.2 as well as 1.1.3. In this video, Mark is in the pilot seat of the controls piloting the SpaceX ITS while I'm going to pretend to be entertaining and discuss some of the finer points of the mission and the amazing ship design that is the SpaceX ITS. So for those of you who are not overly familiar with the SpaceX ITS design, we have a link for this in the description as it's well worth a watch. This is the official video from SpaceX. The rocket is simply massive. There is really no way of comprehending its size and power. The largest rocket launched to date, of course, was the Saturn V, which took men to the moon. And this massive beast had a first stage that ferociously consumed around 13 metric tons of fuel every second, powered by five Rocketdyne F1 engines. The entire Saturn V fully loaded with fuel was close to 3,000 tons in weight. Now, that's mind-boggling. Let's compare this though to the SpaceX ITS design. The SpaceX design is proposed to weigh up to 10,500 tons, which is around three and a half times the weight of the Saturn V. It's also supposed to have 42 Raptor engines in the first booster stage. And these will be fueled with liquid methane and liquid oxygen, punching out a combined total thrust that is just over three and a half times that of the Saturn V as well. So these Raptor engines themselves will have an unprecedented amount of thrust and small prototypes of this engine have already been measured to have three times the chamber pressure to that currently used by the existing SpaceX Falcon 9 Merlin engines. So being anywhere near 42 of these monsters all firing together to boost this massive ITS vessel off the ground would, I suspect, make anyone lose all control of their various orifices. So I suspect there would have to be quite a distance required for spectators to prevent such messiness. As we head up above 2,000 meters per second, the booster will decouple and the ship stage will fire its engines to head up to a low Earth parking orbit. For the ship stage, there will be six vacuum Raptor engines, which are optimized for obviously flight out of the atmosphere. And there are three Raptor sea level engines in the center to initially assist in getting the second stage, some of the way to orbital velocity, and as well, of course, to use when landing on the surface of Mars within the thin atmosphere. So while stage two is powering up to a parking orbit, the booster can flip 180 degrees to point back towards the launch pad. As soon as the RCS thrusters have it facing the opposite direction, the center cluster of seven engines, along with the inner ring of 14 engines, will thrust the booster backwards, not only cancelling out its entire horizontal velocity, but also shooting the booster back towards the launch pad in order to land in the actual launch mount itself. I imagine also if you fired the outer ring of 21 engines at the same time would give the almost empty booster at this stage a thrust to weight ratio that would be so high it would probably damage the booster due to such massive g-forces. As it is, the g-force would be heading up there towards 20g using the central set of 21 engines anyway. After the initial boost back burn, the booster will flip again ready to do its final deceleration burn as it comes back down to land. It's then only going to fire the central cluster of seven engines to wipe off this final velocity. These seven engines are the only engines which will actually have a gimbal on it. And this basically meaning, of course, that the engines can dynamically tilt a few degrees in various directions to allow better pitch and yaw control of the booster when descending into land. And as well, of course, to provide better control in its original ascent and boost back burns. Speaking of landing, the SpaceX presentation shows the booster incredibly landing on the launch mount itself, which I think you'll all agree is a freaking amazing proposal, and I know we'd all love to see this one day. 
That being said, there is no way Mark here can land with the precision of a supercomputer. With any luck, we'll be touching down close to the launch pad. Let's see how we go. And... Uh, flawless. <laughs> nice work, Mark. Flawless landing. So as the booster there touches down, it will start preparing to launch a second tanker refueler to send up after the ship, but we'll cover that later. For now, the ship is going to be very close to full orbital velocity at around the same time the booster lands, and when the ship stops firing its engines finally, it's essentially going to patiently circle the globe in a low Earth parking orbit until the tanker arrives to refuel it quite soon after. And finally deploying those massive solar arrays to generate a huge amount of power for use by our elite Mars crew on their maiden voyage. So we hope you enjoyed part one of our Mars colonization mission. Part two is linked to my channel below, which you can see right now. And thanks very much to the support of our subscribers. And if you haven't subscribed to either of our channels and you have enjoyed this content, please do subscribe to see more. And of course, any likes, shares, and any engagement at all is very much appreciated. We love you guys and we'll see you in part two.